Heavenly Father, again, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you that it is full of teaching and guidance and so much more. And so, Lord, as we look at this together, will you speak through me? And may each one of us have our ears, our eyes and our hearts opened to what you would have us hear today. Bless this word to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so today we're going to look at another of the disciples as we consider, as we continue our um, series on the 12 disciples. And this time it's Philip's turn. Our title for this uh, Sunday is Learning to Trust. And as we look at, let's face it, what is a very well-known passage, I want us all to see what it means to develop a deeper confidence in Jesus' power to work in life's impossible situations. But before we begin, it might be helpful to, to know a little bit more about Philip. As to be fair, he does seem to only get a sort of second billing in the New Testament. Now, he was one of the original 12 apostles, and in the list of the disciples, his name invariably occurs fifth. He was from Bethsaida, a village on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and the same village that Andrew and Peter came from. It's quite likely that he was a first disciple of John the Baptist before he was called by Jesus. And in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, Philip, we find, is only, just, he's only mentioned. But in John's Gospel, he's one of the first to be called. He's instrumental in bringing Nathaniel to Jesus. And as we read in our passage, he's <laughs> mentioned by name in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And we find him again mentioned in John 14, where Jesus is talking to the disciples about he, how he is the way to the Father. He seems to have served as a bit of a contact man for the Greeks and is known for bringing Gentiles to Jesus. And then the last we read of him in the New Testament is Acts 1, where we're told he was among the disciples, sat in the upper room before Pentecost. Now his days after this are shrouded in legend and mystery, but the best traditions say he went on to do missionary work in Asia Minor. And the historian Eusebius says he was a great light of Asia and he was buried in what is now Turkey. And we must make sure as well that the next Philip we encounter is a different Philip because it's Philip the Evangelist, not to be confused with Philip the Apostle. So a little bit more about who we're looking at today. Now, the feeding of the 5,000, as our Bible's name are reading, is the only one of Jesus' own miracles that is found in all four Gospels. And this chapter marks a significant turning point in Jesus' ministry. It begins where he's at the height of his popularity, and it continues to the point where by the end of the chapter, disciples are starting to turn their back on him. But if we come back to our passage, and if we try and look at it without knowing how the story would unfold, it's very easy to see how to all those who were there, and not just Philip, this would have seemed a completely impossible situation. Just imagine what it must have been like. To begin with, there's this huge crowd of people following Jesus because of all the miracles he's performed. We also know it was near the time of Passover, so there would have been a lot of Jews in the area as they were coming to celebrate the Passover. John tells us there were 5,000 men there, but Matthew tells us it was 5,000 men, not counting all the women and children. And so the reality is, that it's, there was going to be a lot more than 5,000. And then we have the fact they're in this remote village. Or the, sorry, this remote area. There's no villages, no market towns, nowhere for people to go and buy any food. 
and the resources would have been hard to find anyway. And then we come to the fact that the disciples themselves have virtually nothing to work with. They didn't even have enough money to buy even a small amount of food for everyone. And the only food they could find was a young boy's lunch. I'm sure if you or I had been there and been facing the task of coming up with a meal for everyone, I suggest we'd have probably thought that's impossible. I mean, I struggled. I'm just cooking in the kitchen for a few people, let alone thousands. Now, Jesus, seeing this crowd approaching, turns, as we read earlier, to Philip and asks him, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, if you'd wanted Philip to come up with a practical answer to the question, then he was the right one to ask, because, as we said, he was a local. But we know that's not the case. John tells us that Jesus' question was a test. He already knew what he was going to do. He was using this problem to challenge Philip's faith. I know I can't say this for certain, but I can imagine what Jesus was hoping Philip might say might have been something along the lines of, I don't have a clue how to solve this problem, Lord, but you do. What can I do to help? That, as we know, wasn't how he responded. And instead, his answer just reinforced how, as far as he was concerned, this problem was insurmountable. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Now, depending on what translation you may have read from this morning, some would say it would have been eight months' wages or it would have cost 200 denarii. But regardless of this, what Philip said is true. They were in a very poor region. The average daily pay for a labourer was one denarius. Even if they had been able to lay their hands on 200, the crowd was so large, it would have only provided each person with a small piece of bread. There seemed absolutely no way forward. But Philip and we can't blame him here, has completely missed the point of Jesus' question. He's only thinking of how the problem can be solved in a practical way. And he's not thinking in respect of having any faith in Jesus' power or ability to provide. Now, I would imagine most of us, if not all of us, will have experienced times in our lives when we have faced difficult, maybe impossible situations, try to solve them using our own abilities, our own means, and doing it in our own strength. We might ask God the question, how am I supposed to sort this out? But only truly turn to him when we've exhausted every other possibility. I know there have been times in my life when I have done just this, and it's taken me a long time to realise that this is not the way to go about it. I have to confess, I have been a pretty slow learner. Now, returning to our story, we can only begin to imagine the impact that all this had on Philip as he witnesses what unfolds, as he sees Jesus' power in action. Five small loaves of bread, two small fish, have become enough to feed everyone who was there. In fact, it was more than enough, as John tells us, that after everyone had eaten all that they wanted, Jesus tells the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. They do as he tells them and end up filling 12 baskets with what is left. I could only imagine how Philip must have felt. He must have been stunned by this miracle. He gets a glimpse of God's abundant provision, just like we so often see the generosity of God's grace when he works in the difficult situations we face. He learned that day to trust Jesus. He learned about God's goodness, what it means to be grateful to God. 
but most importantly, he learned to the futility of trying to solve problems that are beyond our control. Well, wonderful, you might say. That was all well and good for Philip, but what does this passage say to you and me about how we should face the difficult situations in our lives? How do we learn to trust God when our circumstances seem impossible? I'm sure we would all admit again that there are times when it seems that nothing is going right. And in those times, it can become very hard to trust God. Again, I have to be honest and say there's been times in my life when I have really struggled. I find myself asking all sorts of what if questions. What if I can't pay the bills? What if I can't find somewhere to live? What if I can't do my job anymore? How do I get out of the situation I've got myself in? I'm sure you get my point. Instead of trusting God who has promised to be faithful, I trusted in my own ability to find my way through the situation I was in. And my experience was that that was never the best way forward. I usually ended up just worrying, feeling like I was carrying this huge burden and just waiting for my own personal apocalypse, which I was convinced was just around the corner. For me, it has been a long journey learning to trust in God. And not myself. And I very much doubt that I'm the only one here who would say that. And so are there any biblical strategies that can help us to learn to trust God, even when life is really hard and confusing? Well, as I sat preparing for this Sunday, I'd like to suggest five that we could put in our trusting God arsenal ready to be deployed at a moment's notice. Now the first one is to lean not on our own understanding. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. When we feel overwhelmed, burdened, battered by what's going on in life. It is so tempting and it's all too easy to trust in ourselves rather than the Lord. The unfortunate reality is that self-sufficiency is hardwired into our DNA. We can be tempted to think that if we can just come up with the right strategy, do all the right things, make all the right moves, then we can get through this on our own. And of course, as we often find, that's utter nonsense. None of us are really smart enough to navigate our way unscathed through all the ups and downs of life on our own. God's word calls us to trust in him with all our heart and not rely on whatever our own understanding might be. In those times when we find ourselves giving way to fear doubt and worry that's when god wants us to stop trying to rationalize what's happening and just trust in him things might not make sense to us let's face it look at the situation we're in now but god knows exactly what he is doing trusting god starts with not leaning on our own understanding and trusting God with all our heart. Number two, run to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. These are words of real hope. But they also show, don't they, how honest the Bible is, as they make it clear that there will be times of need. There will be times when we are brought low. As I've already mentioned, just think of the situation we've all been living through these past four months. People are broken hearted. 
in tears, frightened, lonely, and feeling absolutely bewildered by everything that's going on. The Bible never claims our lives will be easy and actually makes it clear there will be times when, to be frank, life will be very difficult and we may even feel unable to go on. But what the Bible also does is tell us exactly what to do in those times when life is hard, when we are bewildered, despairing, maybe we're struggling with sin and trusting God feels impossible, we are to just simply run to the throne of grace. And there we will find Jesus, ready to give us exactly what we need. He too endured hardship, temptation, heartbreak and suffering. And because of this, he can give us grace to keep going when we experience the same. When we find ourselves struggling with trusting God, he invites us to simply run to him. And through his mercy and grace, he will help us. And the number three in our arsenal is remembering God's character. Lamentations 3 says this, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So how do we grow in trusting God? Well, we can do it by actively reminding ourselves of God's faithful, steadfast character. And this passage in particular encourages us to remember three specific things about God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The mercies of the Lord never come to an end and they are new every morning. And great is God's faithfulness. Now the amazing combination of God's steadfastness, constant mercy and faithfulness are compelling reasons to trust him. How can we not trust a God whose love for us never changes and is unwavering? How can we doubt a God who has fresh mercies for us every morning? How can we question a God who is unfailingly and forever faithful? I accept a verse like this makes it all sound very easy. But if we're going to succeed in trusting God, then these truths about him must be part, if you like, of our spiritual DNA. It's not just enough to know them as words, but we must apply them to our daily walk with God. When we remember God's character, then we're able to trust him, even when things don't make any sense at all. Charles Spurgeon said this, Let us lean on God with all our weight. Let us throw ourselves on his faithfulness as we do on our beds, bringing all our weariness to his dear rest. Can't really argue with that if I'm honest. And then number four, recall God's past faithfulness. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That verse is another reminder that God is absolutely unchanging. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. He never changes. He never fluctuates. He is unchangeable. So what does all this have to do with trusting God? I, mean, I suggest it's simply this. If God never changes and he's been faithful to us in the past, then we can sh be sure that he will be faithful to us in the future. Again, I can only speak for myself, but I can say that God has most definitely been faithful to me in the past. He sustained me through times of desperate sadness, depression and overwhelming doubt. 
He's kept me safe in times of quite extreme danger when I was a police officer. He's given me hope when it seemed like everything was hopeless. He's restored me when I wandered away and was lost. I could go on and on. Because God never changes, his past faithfulness is a guarantee of his future faithfulness. We can be sure that God will continue to sustain us, uphold us, guide us, because he is our shepherd, who makes us lie down in green pastures, leads us behind, beside quiet waters, puts us on the right path, and he will be with us when we walk through the darkest valley. And then our, the last passage to put in our arsenal. Pray for faith. In Philippians 4, we read, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Ultimately, trusting God is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Even if we know all the truths I've reminded us of, it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to take hold of them by faith, to believe them even when circumstances would say otherwise, to believe them when we're tempted even to lean on our own understanding. To do this, we need the Holy Spirit to move these truths from our heads to our hearts. If that doesn't happen, trusting God will be impossible. And so we must consistently and constantly pray that God will help us to trust him and believe his promises even when life doesn't make sense. Ultimately, the simple yet profound truth is that you and I can do nothing and that includes trust God apart from God. In John 5 verse 5 Jesus himself says I am the vine you are the branches if you remain in me and I in you you will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing apart from me you can do nothing. We're called to put our trust in God, but we can only do this in the strength that comes from him. And in the times when we find it hard, then we must turn to him and ask him to increase our faith, just as the possessed boy's father did in Mark 9.24. Facing an impossible situation with his son, he said to Jesus, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. So there we have it. Five biblical strategies that I hope will help us all when we, find, when we face times just like Philip did. When everything seems impossible and our faith is being tested. It's my hope and prayer that reminding ourselves of some of the truths we have looked at will help us put all our trust in God and in those times simply say to him Lord I don't have a clue what to do here but I know you do. Amen. Let's pray.